Hello, everyone, and welcome to the LQI Roundtable. Today's topic is going to be discussing the impact of purpose in the context of the Great Resignation. I am Lorena Puikai, and I am the founder CEO at CID. We have a clear mission of improving life quality for 1 billion people. And this round table approach is, is our step-by-step -step approach to achieving that goal. I am delighted to be joined today by Brenda Ladley, Senior Vice President, Regional Head of HR for the Americas at Allianz Global Corporate and Speciality, and by Dr. Carlo Pugnetti, Lecturer at Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Brenda, I'll hand over to you for a brief intro and then Carlo, and then we can dive right in. Thanks, Lorena. So I've been with Allianz over 20 years and I've worked in different subsidiaries and uh, Germany, France, the US, and a few different functions, but mainly in HR. Thank you, Brenda. Carlo, over to you. Thank you, Lorena. Um, Carlo Pugnetti, as Lorena mentioned, I am a lecturer at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. I conduct research on behavior of uh, customers and of, um, of employees. I think that will be relevant in this case, especially looking at generational differences. So looking at how Gen Y and Gen Z are different from what, you know, what I used to be and what the old generations are. Um, and uh, what I can also bring to the discussion is line management experience. Uh, Brian and I shared uh, a shared background at Allianz. Um, I uh, was a CEO of one of the Allianz companies here in Switzerland. Uh, I worked in several countries as well before then, so I can bring a little bit more of the flavor of line management, executive management into the discussion. Thank you very much for the intros. So it's always good to start at the beginning. <laughs> so we all talk about the, the great resignation, and I thought it would be great to have um, to define that at the beginning before we start digging into the nitty gritty of the topic and its drivers. So the great resignation is a phenomenon that describes record number of people leaving their jobs after the COVID-19 pandemic ends. So companies now have to navigate the ripple effects of the pandemic as well as reevaluate how to retain talent. The idea, so the great resignation as an idea was proposed by Professor Anthony Klotz of Texas A&M University that predicted a large number of people leaving their jobs after the COVID pandemic ends and life returns to normal. Managers are now navigating the ripple effects from the pandemic as employees reevaluate their careers and leave their jobs in record numbers. Companies uh, record uh, uh, the largest number of open positions to date. And to explore what has been driving the recent shift, a recent in-depth analysis by Ian Cook and his team of more than 9 million employees um, records a record at 4,000 global company revealed two trends. Number one, resignation rates are highest among mid-career employees. And number two, resignation rates are highest in the technology and healthcare industries. So at the onset of the pandemic, the job market was full of uncertainty and mass layoffs. Millions of people lost their jobs and those lucky enough to retain, uh, to remain employed, remained in their roles for survival. However, we now turn towards recovery. Workers in privileged positions won't, <laughs> won't um, who don't live paycheck to pay paycheck are now finally moving on. Most in non-developed economies with the absence of social security and unemployment benefits cannot afford this luxury, but may still be undergoing duress and pent up frustration from the disruption caused by the pandemic. These trends highlight the importance to understanding why people are leaving their jobs and what can be done to prevent the great resignation from expanding. It also calls for a data-driven approach to determine not just how many people are quitting, but who exactly has the highest turnover risk and what we can do to mitigate that risk. So to discuss this very deep, broad, and very sensitive topic today here with uh, Brenda and Carlo, we'll start with, with their opinions as to what do you think caused the great resignation and how have you experienced it in your specific areas over the past two years? 
I can go first. So although we're not a technology company, we have definitely experienced a great resignation. So I, our attrition rate used to be around 10, 12%. And then in 2020, it was, it crept up to 14%. And last year it was close to 20%. So you can imagine if you're losing 20% of your workforce, this is a huge impact, not only on the people leaving, but the people staying. So you have to pick up the work from everyone else uh, or from your colleagues who've left and you're tr training and onboarding new people. So this has been a very big impact for us and it's something we've take very seriously and we've put a number of measures in place, which we can talk about later. Yeah, and if you were to, if you were to make an educated guess as to what do you think the drivers have been mm -hmm. of, of clearly the pandemic played a role, but 20%, it's a very high number specifically in the professional services space. If you were to make an educated guess as to what led to this what would be your take? So we do exit interviews. So I do have data from my exit interviews. You know, unfortunately, this is when people are leaving. So um, we we don't we don't have good data to get ahead of it to, to predict who's going to resign. But in looking at the people who have resigned, the number one reason is career development. Well, I should say the top three, career development, IT tools. So that's a bit of a surprise for us, but I think that younger generations are just have a high expectation that tools are going to work well. And, you know, an insurance company, this is not exactly uh, maybe it's, it's not to the standard of Amazon, let's just say that. So uh, it's tools, it's career development, and then compensation is always in there. But really the number one is, is career development. So uh, much more to be done there. That's very and, and, Can you dive a little bit deeper? Clearly career development is gonna mean different things <laughs> to different generations. And we see now, Typically, career development tended to be a topic for the younger generations. Now it really starts to be a topic across the spectrum mm -hmm. of roles and of ages. Could you elaborate a bit more on that pragmatically? Yes, I, I think that people really want to feel that their employer is taking care. And people, younger people especially, want a more flexible work environment with a focus from their employer on their well being. And so, well being encompasses also your career. You know, I, I'm going to make sure that you have a good career. Work life balance was something that, you know, my generation, nobody talked about. It just wasn't even expected. But younger people, and especially with the pandemic, they're saying, this is really important to me what are you doing to ensure that I have a good work-life balance? And so I think career development balanced with this flexibility and uh, well-being is what's key right now. And it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that career development is part of well-being. Clearly, we, we've developed the Life Quality Index, including specifically both career as well as an overall sense of emotional stability, brain power uh, linked to the physical health elements. Though it's very interesting that, that those start to converge and especially this work-life balance, which historically has been elusive. You know, where, where is it? How do you measure it? When do you know you've reached work-life balance? I think that's what adds to the complexity of organizations being able to support um, employees, colleagues in that specific direction. Thank you very much, Brenda. 
Uh, Carlo, would you like to shed some light from an academic perspective? I know you've done a lot of work with millennials, zillennials, uh, behaviors, attitudes. It'd be great to see how that comes across from the academic perspective. Yes, I think I can share a couple of points. Um, the first one is a distinction between the specific effects of COVID-19 and the long-term generational transitional effects that, we, that we're seeing. We're seeing both of them, but, but some of them are, are really triggered by COVID-19. And two of the most visible ones are, first of all, the, um, the turnover rate in healthcare services. I mean, that is to, to a you know, significant extent linked to the, the amount of work we're asking these colleagues to do. Um, you know, we, we put them on the front line, they're working overtime, they're working in hazardous conditions for themselves. They're afraid of bringing a deadly disease back to their families and to their loved ones. Um, and I think it's only natural that uh, that transforms into a, a turnover rate. Hopefully we can do something to, to, to stop that. Um, the, the other thing that we're seeing that's much broader though, that's related to COVID-19 specifically is the, is the fact that we've been working uh, you know, from home in a lot of cases, which gives us enormous flexibility and in fact, in some jobs, we've seen uh, uh, an increase in effectiveness and efficiency. So if you're an individual contributor in a technical role, it's easier and more effective in terms of output to do your job without the phone ringing and, you know, and people stopping by to ask you to do things. On the other hand, what we're missing is the social interaction. We are social animals. We need to go out and interact with people. And, um, and, and the fact that we're not really able to do that, we were not really able to do this for a long time, and to some extent, we still are not able, this has an impact in our well-being as a person. It has, a, it has an impact on how uh, linked, how part of the organization we feel. And therefore, the less we feel part of the organization, the more likely we are to leave, and the, less, the more frustrated and unhappy we are, the more we're likely to leave. And, and the thing that I, um, I really appreciate that Brenda, uh, you mentioned, is the fact that by the time people leave, right, this is a lagging indicator. Mm -hmm. you, you can no longer do anything about it. What we're missing, and what I was missing when I was in line management, is a solid leading indicator that lets us monitor the situation. So that you know, not only do we, can we make sort of general statements about the fact that people are frustrated because they're working from home, but in fact, there's this group of people who are much more at risk, and therefore we need to do something. You know, what that something is, of course, depends on who these people are and, and, and how much at risk they are. But at least we have some kind of measure of you know, mental, personal, physical well-being and their attitude towards the work and being part of the community, being part of the company. And this is, I think, it's a piece that's really, really missing and that we're paying the price for. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you, Carlo. Yes, I was going to go into the, the deeper aspect, specifically of the generational difference. I know you've done a specific study recently looking at things like goals and long-term planning for the Gen Y, Gen Z, and what differences you've seen in that space, because that links back to career development and links back to what is, what is one's personal definition of uh, life success and work-life balance. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, thank you. Um, and um, so, to to some extent, you know, crises accelerate trends that don't necessarily define trends. So, some of what we're seeing is just an acceleration of this transition due to COVID. Um, but what we're seeing is, you know, of, of course, we know Gen Y, Gen Z are are different from Gen Xs, are different from the previous generations. We've had some experiences in the workplace, but there's also interesting differences between them. Uh, and the, the, the fundamental difference at a, you know, the very fundamental level is that they are much more um, individualistic to some extent. They're much more focused on well-being. They're much more focused on, um, you know, it, to some extent, generation wide, their own well-being and their own experiences. Uh, they're much more oriented to self. Uh, Gen Z, the younger generation, they're much more networked. They're much more interlinked. They're much more ethical in their decision making. And, and they're more realistic in terms of their you know, career development and chances and so on. Um, you know, we've been preaching to them and, and showing that we, we think people should be responsible for their own careers and these generations have taken it to heart. Um, they both show very, very much uh, 
in terms of their personal goals and the, the analysis that we've done um, polled about a thousand uh, Gen Y and Gen Z um, students in our university. They are very focused on, on health goals, on their own health goals, uh, including mental, personal well-being. Uh, and the other piece that they're really, really interested in is ambition and ability, but less in the sense of a career and much more in the sense of a development of their own personal skills. So mm -hmm. they are not necessarily interested in becoming you know, the CEO of the company uh, mm -hmm. and having you know, a lot of money, even though of course that's part of the, the picture. Their motivation is much more intrinsic in terms of developing their skill set and being able to, you know, in, to, to have gainful employment and be flexible about what to do and how to do it. Um, so their ability is, is key. And if we don't put them in situations where they're learning, they get unhappier much quicker than you know we used to be way back when thank you carlo and i think that's really really a vital point because we see the pace of change accelerating mm -hmm. so the university per se does not prepare one for the range of skills that are needed in the jobs that are emerging now i mean every year there's literally a new job title that requires a different set of skills so that, ver that, that ability to learn skills mm -hmm. is equally important mm -hmm. as the ability to translate those skills into a successful job slash work-life balance. Um, and I, I think that's uh, and the difference you've um, highlighted between Gen Y and Gen Z, Gen Z being a lot more ethical as we see with the movements now around COP26 and the impact on the environment and the Greta's of the world, as well as Gen Y being very much focused on uh, their life quality, on the impact that they have in the world at large, relative to what we've seen in Gen X uh, a few years and decades ago. If you were to make an educated prediction, what would you say would be the areas that that organizations need to pay attention to, especially if they are looking to attract the Gen Z and the Gen uh, Ys of the world in the next few years? What what initiatives, what activities? How can they prepare themselves as an organization to better deal both with retaining as well as attracting these two generations? From, First, from an academic perspective, Carlo, and then Brenda, maybe we can go and look at the pragmatic hands-on um, perspective. Sure. So um, if I look at both the study that we did on, on goal setting for Gen Y and Gen Z, and another study that I'm working on for attracting and retaining a Generation Z talent in private banking. So it's, you know, it's very focused on a particular industry. Um, there are really two things that stand out. Uh, one is, again, the skill development. Mm -hmm. it is, um, uh, it's, it's necessary to pay attention and show a track record um, of paying attention to individuals and how they develop over time. And this is a generation that pays attention to ha what happened to other people rather than what companies put out in terms of communication. So the best thing you can do is to have a few people you know, hopefully several, but you know, let's let's start with a few that are, you know, were able to develop their skill set and have those as testimonials for how your company develops a skill set. Mm -hmm. And and this is a critical way of, of attracting new, new people. This this testimonial, personal experience. Uh, and of course, when they enter the company, they're looking for a personal interaction. They don't want to be treated like a number. I mean, not you know, none of us do that, but this generation is particularly keen on on being seen as an individual contributor with you know, skill sets that can evolve, but it's already valuable. That's one piece. The other piece is, is linked to, um, to this personal, you know, personalized environment and has to do, uh, I think, Lorena, you mentioned it already, work-life balance. It is very, very important for people to be able to make the right trade-offs on an individual level about you know, what to do and how to do it. Um, and and I think companies need to, uh, you know, very much adapt uh, the you know the nine to five working mentality to adapt to, 
different locations, different times, and you know, COVID has helped tremendously now with the introduction of tools that allow us to do that. Um, I think it will be important to make sure that A, we don't revert back to nine to five office environment, even though that's important for social interaction, but give some flexibility. Um, and, and, um, and I think we need to pay attention to, 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 to this freedom of, of decision on when and how to do, to do certain uh, tasks in, in the workplace. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, so if, I, if I'm to summarize that, number one, skills development, really understanding what are the type of both social skills as well as business skills that are required for, the, for those individuals to, to, to be successful in the long term, not only in the in the short amount of time that they spend in with one organization. Uh, additionally, the the quality of the interactions. So it's a lot more about walking the talk rather than having really posh communications that go out. So people will look at what you actually do and what is the day to day experience of being with that organization rather than the the tons of messages that are put out there. And number three, in terms of the work-life balance, is finding something that allows for personalization because work-life balance historically meant predominantly how do you bucket your time. Mm -hmm. Now with remote work, number one, HR professionals are so far removed. I mean, they cannot touch the individual in their own environment, so they have a, a much uh, lesser extent of, of contact and understanding. And number two, the nature of that work-life balance expands beyond the time allocation and it goes into understanding how to cope with uh, work demands in the context of the personal needs of the individual and really finding the right way to, to mix those in a way that still allows the organization to act before it's too late to Brenda's point, not at the exit interview to realize, hey, the person would have liked the uh, new skill set, but rather to have a way, a crystal ball maybe, <laughs> to, to look into the future and see what um, what's most valuable for your employee population today. Thank you, Carlo. Brenda, may I hand over to you to the reality check? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Carlo's right, it's not necessarily about career development up, up, up. It is about learning. So people wanna feel that they are developing as a person. Um, the other thing that we noticed what's become more important and maybe for the younger generations, this is what they're used to is more transparency and more communication. So they want to they don't want things happening behind closed doors. So they really want to feel like they want to know what is happening. And so I think that's, uh, you know, a consequence of the internet and social. So the, everything is much more available. Information is available. What your, what your friends and family members are doing at their workplace. When I went to work, I did my job, but you know, social was just, I might meet a friend at a bar, but you didn't have any resources. You didn't have anyone else sort of cheering you on during the day or, or also social can cause stress for people, social media. So we didn't have that. And I think this is given Gen Z and millennials to some extent. Millennials is a little different because the, the Great Recession, they, a lot of them lived through the 2008. So uh, that certainly has an impact on your desire for more stability. But I think both, um, they expect more from their employers in a way that we didn't, you know, in, in my generation. Um, and so we have to step up. We have to know what's going on. We have to provide more well-being options in our benefits. We have to promote those better. We have to be more open with communication. So, you know, and we have to do more in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is another area that they're, they are more progressive. Every young generation is more progressive, 
but especially now with you know again you have more information it's more transparent and the younger generations are saying you need to do better corporate america or you know c corporate bosses we we expect more from you and that's a that's a great uh, you know last last famous words we want more <laughs> <laughs> So if we dive a little bit deeper in that, because what, what we hear from organizations um, in the last six months predominantly is that organizations and HR professionals have gone and they've, they've given everyone meditation apps and movement apps and all kinds of apps. And now in the last few months, we're seeing the employee fatigue because they are over, you know, <laughs> it's like throwing... <laughs> tons of things at employees but it's not really focused and targeted towards exactly what's going to make the biggest difference now mm -hmm. most organizations assume that everyone's stressed <laughs> now, and if you ask if you actually if you actually have a way of uh, preferably not sending yet another survey but if you have a way to 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 understand your employee population bottom up you realize that actually maybe they are overwhelmed with family life. Maybe they are overwhelmed with their environment. Maybe they're, so the stress label is just, it's a convenient mm -hmm. title that doesn't really address the root cause for employees. So while organizations spend ever more money and the budgets have gone up by 40% in this space, purely allocating to well-being, it really, the, the impact is going down and it's the counterproductive outcome because it's not targeted on addressing the root cause. It's not listening to your point. It's not listening to what, what is actually important for the, for the majority and then personalizing the tools such that each person can get something that's relevant to them. So can, can, you, can you talk, of course, I have my own opinion, that is why we've created the Life Quality Index, but I'd be curious to, to understand how you experience that on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you had a magic wand and you were to wave your magic wand, what would you want? What do you think is that solution that, that ticks uh, the boxes you have now open? I mean, you're right about stress. So what one person considers to be stressful, another doesn't. And everybody's at a different stage. And I, I, I have some colleagues and members on my staff who are in city apartments with young children. Wow, that seems really, really, really stressful. But then I have other people who are suffering from loneliness. So they, they live alone. They're starting out their career. They don't want to build a career on their couch. They want, you know, they, they want to have this learning aspect of being in a work environment. I mean, when I was younger, that's where I met my friends and, you know, at work. And so it's hard to do when everything's virtual. So I think stress is very individual, but the other issue is probably for everybody, um, getting good quality data for decision-making. It's very difficult. And as I said, we, we have our exit interviews. We also have an engagement survey, but we only do it once a year. So <laughs> that's, you know, uh, uh, we're discussing changing that because once a year, I mean, that just doesn't cut it. And uh, again, I think younger generations expect more check-ins. So, you know, they're getting dings from friends and family all day long. You know, how are you doing? Have you eaten lunch? This is what I'm doing. Did you see this post? And so I think they expect managers are also going to be doing more of these check-ins and managers aren't necessarily used to that. So that's uh, an extra demand on them. So somehow we have to find this balance, as you said, Lorena, what, what is the key thing that's causing the stress and how can we address that? on an individual basis. That's very hard when you're Alliance with 140,000 employees. Now, I don't have that many, you know, my, my uh, subsidiary has over 4,000, but still 
even, even that many, you know, you, 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 it's very difficult. Thank you, Brenda. And I can imagine even 4,000, let alone 140,000, all in different geographies with different needs at different places in their lives is, is quite a complex problem, which clearly requires technology and requires an ever evolving technology because we cannot mm -hmm. assume that individuals will be able to um, carry the burden of those interactions, store the data, understand what to do with the data and, and make decisions. So it needs, it needs to be a technological solution to this. Very good, I'm mindful we are on, on time here. We're already half an hour that we have allocated. Um, Carlo and Brenda, may I ask you to, if you were to summarize, if you were to think of your powerful magic wand, what would you wish for? What, what do you think would be the biggest contributor to addressing this, this uh, crisis of meaning, of purpose, of life quality that is, that is further exacerbating the consequences of COVID in the great resignation wave? So what, what do you think would be the biggest contributors to support your employees on, on their path, specifically when it comes to such sensitive, intangible topics like purpose. Carlo, do you want to go first? Or? I, would love, I would love to go first. Um, so data, you know, timely data, not on a yearly survey, but as real time as you can get it. And the reason for that is that if you are running a company, you have very detailed information about you know, the status of your supply chain and the capacity planning in your manufacturing plant and the credit worthiness of your suppliers and clients. Um, and the, you know, the loss ratio, if you are an insurance company of your different product lines and so on, you have very, very detailed financial uh, operational information. And you have a very good history of this data and you have reasonably good projection capabilities as well. Right? Mm -hmm. Employees are in this sense, very much of a black box. You know, perhaps it's not quite dark black, pitch black, maybe it's only very, very dark gray because every once in a while you get some information. And the only way you get information about your employees is either because a thoughtful person within the organization and it's usually the head of HR, but it could be other people, raise a flag and say, you know, there's something going on here that we need to pay attention to, or because people start quitting on you. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, way too late. You know, the first one is anecdotal and it depends on, you know, whether or not you have the bandwidth to understand what's going on. And the other one is just way too late. Um, and so, you know, if, if I cannot fix any of the broader issues around, you know, the world economy and COVID and, you know, potential conflict with Russia and all those things, the one thing that at least will let me manage the situation in a proactive way is you know, good, high quality data that lets me drill down into understanding you know, fundamentally individuals, even though of course that information needs to be, uh, needs, needs to be uh, kept confidential, you know, the organization should not see individual employees status, but at least give me a sense of how things are evolving uh, on a timely basis. And, and, and the, the the flip of that is that I can actually then start doing things and seeing what kind of impact I can get. Mm -hmm. And so at least it lets me measure the effectiveness of different tests that I make in this organization. Yes, well, I was gonna wave a magic wand and have COVID be done, but <laughs> assuming- <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on, Brenda, I think everyone wants that. <laughs> But uh, in terms of what I have more control over and in my company, um, I would agree with Carlo, knowing what is it that causes somebody to take that call or, you know, from a headhunter or a recruiter, or what is it that's, you know, the, the, the main reason that they're putting their resume in for another job or that they're even getting job search alerts so what is it that we're not doing and am i doing things that are costly but not that impactful so we we tinker with our benefits and we do get input from employees so um some things that i personally wouldn't think would be that impactful 
you know, employees love, we, we had some webinars on breathing. This is not something I, you know, would be interested in personally, but people gave very about, you know, using breathing to reduce stress, but we filled up all of them and people were really um, very positive. So I think knowing what people, what would really have an impact from a cost standpoint and from a loyalty standpoint would be good, would be great actually. Thank you, Carla, and thank you, Brenda. I think we're really, we're really touching on a few key aspects. So if I am to synthesize our conversation for today, I said there are three, three key areas that require leadership's attention, whether HR leadership or executive leadership. Clearly, Gen Z and Gen Y are two generations apart. So being mindful of the drivers and the things that drive them, impact on society, impact on environment, community, looking at a community, it's much more valuable that they are, they feel part of a community rather than them alone feeling amazing and being promoted. So that, that responsibility in context, very important for Gen Y and Gen Z. Number two, one size does not fit all. So really leveraging the power of technology to personalize the solutions such that whoever is in your organization, irrespective of income level, gender, ethnicity, location, uh, they have a tool that adapts to them, that is giving them what they need, when they need it, and how they want it, whether it's upskilling, whether it's improving their career, their financial well-being, their physical well-being, their mental well-being, their social life, their impact on the environment, really having that in one place. And then the third one, uh, definitely having, having access to a data set that is leading, that is, that is not the exit interview, not the lagging data set, not what has happened last year, because extreme events like COVID, like certain um, political events are not things that one can predict. But if you have your hand on the pulse and you sense what's happening in, in real time, you're able to design a strategy that is delivering the impact that both you want and your employees want, such that you, you know that what, where you're allocating your resources and the ever increasing allocation to well-being and um, uh, wellness, life quality for employees is really delivering that impact, measuring that rather than having a, a subjective emotional um, take as to whether all of those initiatives work. And I see we have one statement question. So right now the job market for talent is tight and those who leave positions have some degree of comfort in knowing that whatever happens, they will be secure. Anticipating perhaps that this might eventually change. Will this perhaps mute the trend and cause people to value the security element of employment that might have guided their parents' generation? This is from Peter Lefkin. Thank you, Peter, for the question. I, I will venture an answer and then I'd love to hear Brenda as well as Carlo. Um, number one, in any type of extreme situation, you have, I like the pendulum analogy. So it goes in one direction and then it starts to come back and then it goes again until it reaches a form of equilibrium. So I think from what I'm seeing, the trends in the market and what I am hearing bottom up from employees and, and um, organizations is that there are a few trends. Of course, uh, we have now the, the great resignation. The employee is in a much stronger position to negotiate the next opportunity because the job market is, is so tight. However, we also have the trend of a lot of jobs moving into the gig economy meaning that the nature of the jobs, a lot of jobs that historically have been full-time are moving into the uh, gig space. And maybe that trend together with this trend will lead to a, a very different talent marketplace. It's not something that we can fully grasp today, but it's gonna give a lot more flexibility, but also require a lot more effort to allocate the right resource to the right job in the right location. 
you can't have one employee that you say, okay, that part is taken care of, but rather you need to be more flexible and have systems that recognizes in advance what the needs would be such that you can allocate the next, uh, the next resource in the right place. Uh, Brenda, Carlo, look forward to your thoughts as well. Um, I would also say security becomes more important as you start to have a family and get a mortgage. So it doesn't matter what generation you are. I can tell you when Gen Z starts getting married, wanting to buy a house, wanting to have kids, security is going to become more important. And also you know, the ethics of the leaders will become more important. This is something as you get older, you understand the importance of having leaders that are ethical in the company. Uh, it doesn't mean that younger people don't want ethical leaders, but it wouldn't be top of mind as it, as it becomes as you get older and then this financial security becomes more important. Um, I think younger people, you're still looking for experiences. That's, that's important. So the learning, the experiences, can the company send me on an assignment? Can I do a project in another place? I, I think the gig economy, what that is doing is people who've done that, they like the flexibility. They like saying, well, today I'm, you know, I'm not feeling it. So I'm not going to go drive Uber or I'll do it tonight. Or so, and we're certainly seeing that, that people, they really don't want to come back to the office. I mean, they're they, all employees are saying, we don't want to go back to the way it was. We've now taken up hobbies. We've seen how much time we have without commuting. We don't want to go back to the way it was. You have to change. Thank you, Brenda. Carlo, the academic perspective. So first of all, it's good to see you, Peter. Thanks for joining us. I hope you're doing well. Looking forward to uh, catching up in person soon. Um, uh, so I think, you know, of course, there, there is, um, the, you know, there is a piece of this that's contingent on job opportunities being available and being there. Uh, but I think the fundamental movement long term is much deeper. And it's much deeper um, because Gen Z is already quite aware of you know, the precarious situation of the careers, and they're very much focused on safety and security. They, they, mean, they, 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 do, um, they do value security, job security at a much higher level that companies are able to provide that today. So that's already the case. What they have, what they seem to have internalized, you know, it's really early in their career, so maybe they will change in their lives. So that's going to change, might change over time. But what they seem to have internalized is that is that the best way to have security is to have marketable skills, which links back to if we don't provide them in the job they have now, they will quit out of a need fundamentally of long-term security because if they're not developing their skill set, they're stuck in a dead end job where they fear that we will let them go in five years time and in five years, they really will be obsolete in the skill set. So I think of course, you know, as the opportunities, as the, as, the, as the job market dries out a little bit, pulls off a little bit, of course, I think we will see an impact of that. But I think the fundamentals are that this generation is looking at their skill set and are willing to make uh, short-term trade-offs even in order to, to, to get there. Thank so you, I'm a little bit counter, you know, counter, current in this uh, in this in this topic that's brilliant that's what brings gets you to the to the essence of an argument um i would second that with the what we're seeing now specifically in the technology tech startup scale up space where a lot of a lot of the people that have spent two three four five years in the corporate space have started to migrate now to the uh, scale up startup world because a startup is giving you an experience across so many different dimensions that you know two three years in a startup and you basically can can choose your next job while the bigger the organization the more specialized and narrow the skill that they have so we see a we see kind of a shift to a, a very experienced very high quality talent shifting into the startup and scale up world because it enables them to gain so much in such a short period of time 
and still gain from the upside of the business through shares and equity, which the larger the organization, the less that's part of the, of the package. Very good. Thank you, Peter, for the question. And I think with that, I am going to wrap up the, the round table for today. Thank you very much, Brenda and Carlo. We got to an interesting conversation to get a little bit closer to the um, essence of the insight as to what's going on and now with the great resignation and what are some of the tools, some of the initiatives and some of the perspectives that organizations can take to proactively uh, put in place strategies to adapt the organization to the needs of the new generations coming in and also to take steps to retain the current talent because a lot of them, they would much more prefer to stay with the current organization should their voice be heard rather than keep on hopping around between different organizations. So on that note, thank you once again and thank you for thank you to our audience and look forward to seeing you in a month time for our financial well-being angle to to what's happening in the talent and job space. <laughs>